straight from the Uber files, Uber leveraged violent attacks against its drivers, against us, this community, right, to pressure politicians. In push for global expansion, company officials saw clashes with taxi cab workers as a way to win public sympathy, a trove of new documents shows, right? I'm not surprised that this guy is going to go to jail. There will be charges and other heads will roll. No doubt about it. Right. So um, here we go. Let's uh, jump straight in. Five years into Uber's war to supplant the taxi industry, executives at the ride hailing app were in danger of losing a crown jewel in their global conquest. Paris. The San Francisco startup was flush at the start of 2016, valued by investors at more than $50 billion and was racing to expand into Africa, India, and Asia. But Uber's first international outpost, the French capital, had become the center of a bloody battle over the company's ambition, a trove of documents from inside the corporation shows. In the previous year, more than 80 Uber drivers had been physically attacked across Europe and dozens of their cars destroyed in clashes with taxi drivers who were fearful of losing their livelihoods as Uber's low fares upended their industry. When protests against the company erupted in Paris, managers began working from an unmarked office and for safety reasons were ordered not to wear Uber branded clothing. In public, the documents show. In a series of text messages on January the 29th, 2016, Uber's then chief executive, Travis Kalanick, pushed his top lieutenants to mount a counter protest. Kalanick wanted a peaceful sit in or march in the city center, civil disobedience, 15,000 drivers, 50,000 riders, he wrote in a burst of unpolished, often abbreviated messages. One executive in response raised concern about taxi violence against Uber drivers, and another said the company could look at effective civil disobedience and at the same time keep folks safe. Kalanick shot back, saying that if the crowd was big enough, Uber drivers would be safe, and if clashes did occur, he appeared to suggest that would benefit Uber too. I think it's worth it, the chief executive wrote. Violence guarantee success. There's the proof from the files. Thank you, Mr. McGann, for having the balls to expose all of this. Thank you for leaking the documents. Thank you for being the whistleblower. Travis Kalanick, on January the 29th, 2016, at his 6.11 a.m., we have 50,000 riders. They won't and can't do anything. Travis Kalanick, 6.12 a.m. I think it's worth it. Violence guarantees success. Travis Kalanick at 6.16 a.m. And these guys must be resisted. No. Agreed that right place and setup must be thought out. The text exchange is among more than 124,000 company documents obtained by The Guardian and shared with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, a nonprofit newsroom in Washington that helped lead an examination of those records. Reporters from the Washington Post and more than 40 other news organizations around the world collaborated over four months to mine the trove of corporate emails, instant messages, company presentations, briefing papers, invoices, and other documents. The documents provide a vivid insider account of how from 2017, so from 2013 to 2017, Uber used bare knuckle tactics to expand rapidly around the globe as it became one of the most used transportation companies on the planet. The company launched operations on four continents in rapid succession, often without seeking licenses to operate as a taxi and livery service, casting itself as merely a technology platform that connected willing passengers and drivers. To try to rewrite laws to reorganize its position, Uber exported sophisticated American lobbying methods, the documents show, 
and it leveraged violence against its drivers in its efforts to win sympathy from regulators and the public. In some instances, uh, when drivers were attacked, Uber executives pivoted quickly to capitalize, the documents show. If a driver had been stabbed or beaten or bricks had been thrown at his car, company officials behind the scenes provided details to the media if they thought the violence would result in negative attention for the taxi industry. The communications show Uber would simultaneously activate its lobbyists using attack, attacks on drivers to secure meetings with politicians and push for regulatory changes, the documents show. There's some taxi guys kicking an Uber vehicle, right? In the case of the demonstration in Paris, Kalinick and Uber managers helped arrange for a public show of support for the company at a time when taxi drivers were already clashing with police over Uber's growing presence in the country. By the way, when they talk of other managers, one of them was Pierre Dimitri Gore, who still works for you. Dara Kosha, shall we fire him today? The night after the counter protest in the city center, police said they intervened to prevent serious injuries as some 50 taxi drivers clashed with Uber drivers on the outskirts of Paris. Two former Uber executives who spoke on condition of anonymity said that company officials saw potential utility in the violation clashes and sought to capitalize on such incidents for public relations and political benefit. One said that the company would have been foolish not to do so. We can't, um, why can't we be as fierce competitors as they are, so long as we are doing it in a reasonable legal way, the person asked. The other former executive who had knowledge of Kalanick's push for the Paris counter protest, protest said the episode fit a pattern. It was considered as beneficial to weaponize Uber drivers in this way to get them to stand up for what they wanted. And of course, that served Uber's purpose. In response to questions from the Post, Jill Hazelbaker, Uber's senior vice president for marketing and public affairs, acknowledged past mistakes in the company's treatment of drivers, especially under Kalanick, who was forced out as chief executive by investors in 2017. And current treatment of drivers, poor current treatment under Dara Koshishawi. But she said no one, including Kalanick, wanted violence against Uber drivers. I call BS. There is much our former CEO said nearly a decade ago that we would certainly not condone, condone today, she wrote. But one thing we do know and feel strongly about is that no one at Uber has ever been happy about violence against a driver. But he pushed it, and so did the executives at the time. So whatever she tries to say, it doesn't make that statement better. Devin Spurgeon, a spokesman for Kalanick, said in a statement to the Post that any suggestions he acted inappropriately was false. Mr. Kalanick never suggested that Uber should take advantage of violence at the expense of driver safety. It said the company expansion initiatives were led by over 100 leaders in dozens of countries and were carried out with full approval of Uber's robust legal policy and compliance groups. It continued, Uber became a serious oh, competitor in an industry where competition had been historically outlawed. As a natural and foreseeable result, entrenched industry interests all over the world fought to prevent the much needed development of the transportation industry. The documents shed new light on how Uber's arrival in Paris and around the world drove taxi drivers to desperation. Uber burned through investor money suddenly and radically altering the ride hailing market with artificially low fares when it entered a new foreign city, especially in Europe, where some of the most violent protests unfolded. In Madrid, the documents show the company at one point was paying incentives of $17.50 an hour to each driver, accounting for almost two thirds of their pay. In Hamburg, Uber drivers would have made $2.20 per hour under market conditions minus a small commission, but the company paid each driver an additional $15 per hour, giving away rides almost for free. Uber was spending heavily to influence the levers of power in countries it entered. Globally, the company budget for policy and communication work was $90 million in 2016, according 
to one draft budge, budget document. Uber confirmed that the figure was accurate and that about 45% went to public affairs work overseas. To press its case with foreign governments, the company was also spending heavily to hire big names such as David Plouffe, a senior White House ad advisor under President Barack Obama. As it operated in some countries despite court orders to desist, Uber maintained a 24-hour multi-country emergency response system that was used to keep company information out of the hands of investigating authorities, the documents show. The kill switch, as the company's chief executive and others called it, was used at least a dozen times to sever connection to Uber's internal computer networks as investigators moved in, sometimes with employees using stall tactics to keep detectives away from screens until they went dark. Hazel Baker said Uber does not employ such tactics today. She said mistakes made under Kalanick led five years ago to one of the most infamous, infamous reckonings in the history of corporate America. That reckoning led to an enormous amount of public scrutiny, a number of high-profile lawsuits, multiple govern, government investigations, and the termination of several senior executives. It's also exactly why Uber hired a new CEO, Dara Koshishawi, who was tasked with transforming every aspect of how Uber operates. We have not and will not make excuses for past behavior that is clearly not in line with our present values. Instead, we ask the public, public to judge us by what we've done over the last five years and what we will do in the years to come, Hazel Baker said. The statement provided by Kalanick's spokeswoman said there are legitimate business purposes for companies operating overseas to use tools to restrict access to their computer networks, including protecting intellectual property and the privacy of their customer, as well as ensuring due process rights are respected in the event of an extrajudicial raid, continued. These fail-safe protocols do not delete any data or information, and all decisions about their use involved were vetted by and were approved by Uber's legal and re regulatory departments. Plouffe said in a statement that Uber and governments had to find a way forward in a legal landscape that was at times unsettled, but Plouffe said that internally he sometimes protested the company's tactics. During my time at Uber, there was a very public, global, and sometimes fierce debate about how and whether ride-sharing should be regulated, Plouffe said. Sometimes those debates and negotiations were straightforward. Sometimes they were more challenging and sometimes where people within the company who wanted to, go, wanted to go too far. I did my best to object when I thought lines would be crossed, sometimes with success, sometimes not. Today, Uber has abandoned its ambitious, ambitious ambitions to dominate markets such as Germany and India. It is winding down its operations in Russia and has pulled out of China altogether. In some countries, Uber has begun to work with the taxi industry. It couldn't replace allowing passengers to book cabs, cab rides on its apps. Pathetic. Nonetheless, Uber is growing. The company operates in 71 countries and looks uh, books some 19 million trips over its app each day. Testament to its convenience for customers and to the weakness the company rightly identified in the taxi industry's ability to meet the demand. In the wake of that success, um, our altered lives and livelihoods, taxi drivers from Cape Town to Connecticut have been plunged into financial hardship according to records and interviews stra strapped by falling fares and in some cases encumbered by debt from mortgage taxi licenses that have plummeted in value. As the Uber subsidies waned, many of its drivers also have struggled to make ends meet. Uh, from New York to New Delhi, a handful of taxi and Uber drivers have died by suicide, citing deep debt and disgust with the company. Moments of candor tucked in the gigabytes of leaked internal records show that some Uber executives knew early on that the phone app was on a collision course with hard realities. Cocktails and war stories is exactly what we both need. Man, um, are there some good ones. Uh, get some sleep when you can. Remember that everything is not in your control and that sometimes we have problems because, well, we're just effing illegal, right? That's an email, because we're effing illegal. 
Get some sleep when you can. The company's head of communications, Nairi Hordajian, wrote to the company's top European lobbyists in December 2014, remember, remember that everything is not in your control and that sometimes we have problems because, well, we're just effing illegal. Hordajian declined to comment. Embrace the chaos. In the 15 years after he dropped out of UCLA in 1998 to start a file sharing company, Kalinick knew only the scrappy world of silicon startups. He went without a paycheck for years at a time, living with his parents and putting everything he had into one venture after another, each seeking to strike it big by using computers to disrupt antiquated market. Um, after launching Uber in San Francisco in 2010, Kalinick enjoyed increasing celebrity and wealth and millions in seed funding was ballooning into what would eventually be billions in venture capital. But he could not shake the startup mindset, the sense that he was the challenger taking on Goliath. I'm still the David, Kalanick told an audience at a tech conference in 2014. The opponent is um, an AH named Taxi, he said. Um, nobody likes him. He's not a very nice character, he said adding that we have to bring out the truth about how dark and how dangerous and how evil taxi side of things is. Domestically, Uber had faced pushback from the taxi unions and challenges from other startup ride-hailing apps, not the least of which uh, was Lyft. Kalanick recognized that feuding with the up-and-coming competitors could quickly become a race to the bottom to out-subsidize riders' fares. To keep ahead, he sought to push Uber into new markets where its prime adversary would be the legacy taxi business. Kalanick set a goal of operating in 500 cities worldwide by 2017. In some of those places, there were no laws governing Uber's business model and cities embraced it. But in many others, as had been the case across much of the United States, the laws were complex and unsettled. And the question of how they apply to Uber and similar companies was in dispute. In early 2014, the company heavily promoted the hashtag Uber Everywhere, highlighting dozens of cities worldwide where it had launched operations. In a memo to Uber's managers in India that August, Alan Penn, whom Kalanick had tapped to lead Uber's expansion across Southeast Asia, summed up his view of the company's approach. Embrace the chaos. The company had started there with a luxury car offering, but was drawing objections from regulators as it pressed into what was expected to be much bigger market of low cost ride hailing. We will likely have both local and national issues in almost every city in India for the rest of your tenure at Uber. So get used to this, Penn said. We will generally stall, be unresponsive and often say no to what they want. That is how we operate and it's nearly always best. To be clear, Penn wrote, echoing his boss, Uber's troubles were the fault of the taxi industry and jealous upstarts. Competitors apply this pressure to governments to F with us because they want to disrupt our business growth. Penn did not respond to emails and messages seeking comment. It wasn't just India and France. Taxi drivers on three continents were protesting during the summer of 2014, calling on the officials to clamp down on Uber's ride hailing for allegedly violating local laws. Authorities from Thailand to the Netherlands were investigating in Germany. Courts in Hamburg and Berlin were asked to decide if Uber was legal. Frank Horsch, Hamburg's Senator for Economic Affairs, said in an interview in August that he wanted to ban Uber for not having permits to operate. Inside Uber, Horsch's comments drew immediate attention. A network of employees monitored threats and comments made about the company around the clock. Uber's communications teams had built 89 databases spanning five continents and containing a combined 2,000 names of people the company saw as threats or points of opportunity for influence or lobbying according to documents. Now, if they are monitoring threats on the internet today, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, there are thousands and thousands of drivers issuing threats because they're fed up. Their livelihoods have been impacted by these assholes, by these executives. So um, it's a hated company at the moment. It's not liked, right? 
So it's good that they're monitoring it because they can actually then start seeing the level of hate against their company. In response to the German lawmaker's comment, an Uber lobbyist wrote, Horsch needs neutralizing politically as well as in media terms. Uber campaign. With investors including Google voicing concerns, Kalanick set in motion a newly focused effort to win over politicians needed to rewrite laws around the globe to facilitate Uber's operations. He announced on August the 19th, 2014, that the company was hiring a campaign manager with name recognition among leaders worldwide. Plouffe, who had led Obama's 2008 presidential campaign, Kalanick boasted that Plouffe would be senior vice president of policy and strategy and Uber's field general in charge of messaging and beating the big taxi cartel. Plouffe was more diplomatic, writing on the company's website that Uber had a chance to be a once in a decade if not once in a generation company and telling Politico his job would be to change the point of view established of, of established politicians. So you guys can uh, go through um, the entire um, article. I'm going to leave the link. Um, I'm going to leave the link underneath the video. Please share your comments. It is long. It's probably another 10, 15 minutes long. So if you want to read it, uh, go to the link below and pick up where I left off. Be safe out there. Thank you.